Support Wrestle Talk. Donate on Patreon. Hello and welcome to Wrestle Ramble. This is Luke Owen. I'm Ollie Davis, and today we're talking about this week's episodes of Raw and SmackDown, including Vince McMahon's return to WWE TV, Braun Strowman versus Brock Lesnar, and loads and loads of meta shooting, and deciding which episode we prefer. If you want to go right to any of those discussions, click the timestamps in the video description below, or stay right here where we were gonna say briefly subscribe to the podcast we do it every week it's an excellent podcast i don't know why you're not subscribed to it if you are already asked if you're not already subscribed to it, i should say if you already are subscribed to it then well done you you have made an excellent choice that was as, smooth man wasn't it just as, as the uh, the lad says in uh, in uh, indiana jones and the last crusade you have chosen wisely and if you haven't subscribed you have chosen poorly cool so be wise rather than poorly when we make a trailer or some form of advert for the podcast mm-hmm. can we just take that little clip <laughs> and he can be saying it to people actually we've got uh, something else to talk about regarding the podcast yeah and patreon people we've been a uh, a lot of well, we've been trying to find a way to revamp our patreon because so much has changed since i started it up last year in september you know luke's come on board hello we're doing the wrestle ramble three times a week which was our you know that was our last big goal mm. we've achieved all the goals which sounds really cool but actually it's depressing at the summit there's nothing else to conquer isn't that what alexander the great did when he looked across the lands and wept? Tears of salty <laughs> sorrow because there was no more left to conquer. That's, a, that's an infamous darts call. Have Is you it ever really? heard that? No. It was a, well, I can't remember the name of the commentator. He's very famous. Uh, but he, he, like in, in Snookery, he once referenced to someone being Pythagoras because even Pythagoras couldn't do those <laughs> angles. But that particular call was when uh, a darts, someone in darts in the 80s became world champion at the age of 28. And the guy was like Jim Ross levels of putting it over and said, you know, Alexander the Great was 29 when he looked across <laughs> and he, he weeped uh, tears of sorrow because there were no more lands left to conquer. This guy is only 28. <laughs> <laughs> It was Excellent. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's if I was a wrestling commentator, that's, that's a that, sort of obscure history reference. That would, would be like your gimmick. Um, but yes. Uh, I can't remember. Yes, that's it. We were talking about Patreon. How's that for rambling? Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're rejigging it a bit. And we want to give people who donate... At, at the moment, it's $5. You get the Saturday episode a, a day early. Mm-hmm. But now, we want to give you a whole freaking show. You're going to get extra content as a $5 backer. So, starting this month, we're going to be introducing the Wrestle Ramble bonus podcast... And this bonus podcast will be Ollie and I reviewing a pay-per-view that you, the, the Swaft Nation, the Swaft Nation Swaft backers, Nation. Ha- have chosen. We will give you a, a list of five. You will vote on those in the Wrestle Talk News, which will go up tomorrow, and we will watch one of those pay-per-views mm. and then review it for the bonus podcast that five dollar backers and above get. So yeah, that's a for this first month we've decided the five yes. that are up for the poll, and you can you can vote. But in future months, we aim that everyone can pitch in. All of the Patreon backers can have a vote on uh, which pay-per-view we, we do. Exactly. And uh, if you are, a, I think it's a $50 backer or more, a $25 backer, it might be a 51 actually. There yeah, is one of our, there's one of our things. We, we, we have worked it out, but there's yeah. one of the tiers that means you actually get to suggest some of the, pot, some of the mm. pay-per-views that we might then put up for uh, a vote the following month. But should we go through the five that are going to be going up tomorrow very briefly? Yes. Uh, we, we've tried to split it in, because I think a lot of people want, to, want us to watch really terrible pay-per-views. <laughs> yeah. You know, because that's what people do. And or or you can have like just really good classic pay per views. I don't think anyone wants us to watch an okay pay per view. No one wants us to watch a pay per view that is just there's nothing to say about it. So uh, the t- the five which will be in the poll in tomorrow's Wrestle Talk news for everyone to vote on for that first episode, exclusive to Patreon donators, uh, of five dollars or more. Well. God, this is a tongue twister. The plugs have been seamless today. Our <laughs> uh, WWF SummerSlam 2000. And why have you chosen that one, Ollie? It's my personal favorite pay per view of all time. Told quite quite an emotional story you about did why it is on a previous ramble episode yeah. i think if you search for um uh, favorite pay-per-views of all time i think there's an episode called that it was a weekend one yeah and you talked extensively about your love for SummerSlam 2000 get the hankies out because it's both sad 
and arousing. Uh, and that is a pay-per-view that features the, the, the triple threat at the end between Kurt Angle, Triple H and The Rock for the WWF Championship and TLC... Uh, the first TLC first ever TLC first ever TLC between the Dudleys Edge and Christian and the Hardy Boys and I mean what a spectacle that match is and uh, quite timely considering Shane might be having a big spectacle match Shane McMahon versus Shane Blackman oh that's on that paper battle of the Shane you mean Steve Blackman Yes, <laughs> where Shane takes a bump off the Titan Tron. Let's run through these quickly. Uh, WCW Starcade 97. Uh, so I chose that one. It's WCW's most successful pay-per-view of all time. And for those of you who watch my Remember When series, this was the infamous Sting versus Hulk Hogan match for the World Heavyweight Championship. There was 18 months worth of build to this one match, and it was the most successful pay-per-view WCW ever ran. And there's actually some other cracking matches on there. ECW One Night Stand, the second one. Because I've never seen it. Yeah, I'm quite a shame to say. You know, like so. You know, like some people haven't seen Rocky, or some people haven't seen The Godfather. Hello. You, you, this is like my my big thing that I've never seen. Yeah, but you've seen the first one, haven't you? Yeah, I've seen we, the, we, love we, the first. One. And that's what I thought we were doing because I've even written in the notes featuring a great match between Mike Horse yeah, and Masato yeah, Tanaka. But storm in, ahead with the description. <laughs> but so in fact, the second ECW One Night Stand featured Rob Van Dam challenging John Cena for the WWE Championship, yeah. Sabu taking on Rey Mysterio for the World Heavyweight Championship. And uh, there's a bit of a schmoz match in the middle of it, of course, an ECW thing. Taz's return to the ring, I think, was on that show as well against Jerry Lawler. Yep. And uh, just rounding out the final two, WCW Halloween Havoc 98. Featuring the in-ring return of the Ultimate Warrior, a match that Dave Meltzer gave minus five stars. It would have been minus six stars if it was in Japan. <laughs> and uh, to the other end of the quality scale, Money in the Bank 2011. Which is the infamous John Cena CM Punk World title, WWE title yeah. match after the pipe bomb promo? Yeah, so tune into the Wrestle Talk News tomorrow to vote. To one of them, there's like three episodes tomorrow. Uh, one of them to vote in that. And the other thing we've got going concurrently to this is that a punishment has been decided. It certainly has. And you are not. You and I are not like most girls. No. So the loser of this month's battle, Wrestle Ramble battle. We'll have to make a cover version of Nia Jax's I'm Not Like Most Girls entrance theme. I mean, it's a banging theme, too. It's a banging it? theme. Uh, I haven't actually looked at all the lyrics. I just know I the, the I title bit. Don't, don't need to, mate. I know it already. Over 50%. No, just under 50%. So that is a huge margin. It was a huge way. margin. Who was the who was second? Was it Cena's Thugonomics? No, I believe it was Sexy Boy by Shawn oh, Michaels. Oh, really? Yeah. See, so. I was um, singing that round the house uh, after telling the lady partner about the poll. Mm. Um, talking about I started singing Sexy Boy and she had never heard that song before but said it's the most arousing song she's ever heard oh I bet it was <laughs> I bet it was and then you went into the bedroom and popped on <laughs> Triple H Shawn Michaels 2002 <laughs> on the WWE Network what a what a that's what a woman wants that is what a woman to wants to watch classic wrestling matches online in fact the, the Mel Gibson movie What Women Want is mm. more or less about uh, him getting Helen Hunt to watch SummerSlam 2002 that's all he hears from people <laughs> he's just walking on the street ah oh, it was such a good match ah oh, Shawn Michaels was really good in a comeback like, oh, oh Brock Lesnar rock I never yeah. knew I never knew <laughs> should we get on with the Raw yeah, reviews let's do it Haha, it's a Raw review looking jacked, man! Raw kicked off with a mirror image of the previous week, which was Roman Reigns this time taking on Jason Jordan, which is a very nice way to get Jason Jordan over, much better than what they were originally doing by forcing him into an intercontinental title feud with The Miz, which is far too much, far too soon for his singles push. And last week he had a competitive showing against John Cena. This week he had a competitive showing against Roman Reigns. Two top guys... He valiantly went against and he got the rub. I, however, thought the Cena match was better. Oh, really? Whereas, uh, whereas not, not not by a huge margin, but a lot of people I've seen have said the, the Reigns match is much better. In fact, in my notes here, I've written great match, so much better than last week. So much better than last I week. I thought this match was vastly superior mm. to last. And I really liked last week's match, but I thought this one was better in every single way. Less goofy selling, uh, more believable. Uh, I just I thought it was great. I thought both did so well, and uh, the the because Roman was working heel throughout the match, which I think really added to it. And jo Jason Jordan was great being, being a babyface in peril. I just thought it worked so well, and I thought to myself, man, this heel Roman character could really get over if the co if the commentators weren't yeah. putting him over as a valiant babyface. Yeah, that's the thing. Roman did work heel. Like there was a moment where 
he had Jordan in a in a chin lock for a good forty five seconds. Yeah, and I thought this is this is Reigns being a heel. It's it's so much more natural. Just the, I know he's got a pretty face, but he looks mean. Yeah, he's got he a pouty face. Mean. Yeah. And uh, but he's got sexy, greasy hair. Does <laughs> work counter to that? He's all in black. Yep. He doesn't look like your he stereotypical wears a chest protector. Yeah, he's not a blue-eyed baby face like Cena is. And it's yeah, I he d- works so well as a heel. I I'm a big Roman Reigns fan mm. in ring. I think his promo work is the, the material that he's given is absolute garbage. And I really don't think that this this baby face run that is being forced upon him and being forced outwards by the commentating team really doesn't help him but man is he good mm. he's so good in the ring he's yeah yeah but i think a lot of people get clouded by the presentation of roman reigns and that is that's a wwe top brass vince mcmahon writing thing yeah roman reigns as a performer as a talent is really 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 really, really so good. good and he worked so well with jason jordan mm. i loved this match and um, but let's move into what came next oh, God. which was what did come next ollie which was our third Shoot promo in uh, in as many weeks. The first week was amazing. We we were both like, holy hell, that was a really good promo. Loads of talking points from it. There was the moment when Cena ad libbed and Roman flubbed his lines, and it was, oh, this feels real, and that's what you want from wrestling. Second week, they made a penis joke. Mm-hmm. Can get on board with that. Always always love a penis joke. And this week it was just. The law of diminishing returns. Wasn't it? Just as soon as, like, because they cut backstage and then they had Charlie Caruso. Is that the robot they have on Raw? One of them. One of the robots they've got on Raw. uh, Sort of like, up to him. And uh, there was like, John Cena, what did you make of that match? And then uh, John Cena was like, well, I'm going to go tell Roman to his face. And I was like, oh, for God's sake. Yeah, I felt I've seen this segment two weeks running now. I don't need to see another version of this. And that's all we got was just another version of the same promo we've had for the last two weeks and this this really comes into um so we put up a video on uh sunday about the the worst things about the brand split the five worst things about the brand split and in that i said that there were feuds growing stale that was one of our points and you and i have talked about feuds going stale mentioning the point that like randy orton and jinder feuded for four months miz and uh, dean ambrose feuded for what, a year and a half or whatever it was and how those feuds grew stale and what a lot of people misinterpreted that is it's just that people thought that long feuds are a bad thing mm-hmm. and that's not the that's not what we were saying long feuds are great long feuds are brilliant the problem is when you just do the same thing week in week out that's when they grow stale and by th- week three of this feud it's starting to grow stale it's typical wwe of, and it's this is symptomatic throughout the entire night just not this segment wwe found something that worked three weeks ago, which was an electric promo segment between Cena and Reigns, and now they're just doing it to death. And so they had uh, Enzo and Miz do it yeah. later on. They had Shane and Kevin do it on SmackDown last week. Yeah. You sort of had Kevin and Vince doing it again this week. It's, yeah, it's it's the distraction roll-up finish. Mm. They find a finish that they like, and then they just keep doing that finish. But this wasn't without good lines. No, no, Cena's, no, no, not to take it away. Yeah, Cena's last line, which really should have been saved for a go-home segment, unless they've got something even better. Like, they bust out a swear word. They, they, <laughs> they use a cuss. Um, was at no mercy. Consider me like a, what was it, it? Consider me like a drugs test. You can't pass. Yeah, me. you can't. Which is of course a reference to Roman's uh, wellness policy violation last year, which was a huge like that's a money line. But the crowd were just kind of like ooh, and that's <laughs> it. You know, we it's like we'd gone. It it was just too much in consecutive weeks. Uh, the other problem I, I have with this feud at the moment is that. Um, John's the only one who's right. Like, really, for this mm. to work is that John and Roman need to both be making points that are correct, so that you're like, "Oh my god!" Like, they're they're both right, and I don't know who I want to agree with more. Whereas the moment it's like, "Yeah, John, everything you're saying is right," and then Roman says doofus things like, "Ticket sales are up." No, they're not. Revenue is up. No, it isn't. So I was like, as you said in the review, tell that to Pyro, mm. and then made the point is like, you can't even break into Hollywood. I was like, he's doing really I was like, well. He's doing really well. He's just yeah. he's in the new Transformers movie. That's that's huge. He's up for Shazam if rumors are to be believed. Mm. Like he has broken into Hollywood. Like, oh yeah. I mean, I know a guy that can help you out. He doesn't need help. He's already broken into Hollywood. That was uh, yeah. It was it was stuff that just didn't. When they first did it, it felt real. 
but now it just felt like two guys trying to be real, which was really exposed by, yeah, the, the revenue's up, but what about Pyro? And I, I imagine being there in the arena, because we were sent um, a few photos of Raw, there were vast empty parts on the hard cam side that the, the TV broadcast didn't show. The top section was all curtained off. Ticket sales are not great. And no. it was in that night specifically in Anaheim. And it wasn't great. So you're sitting there live and Roman's saying this and you're looking around <laughs> going, is it? <laughs> is it doing no, that well? And the cra- you can tell that it, it was a line that fell flat because the crowd didn't react. Yeah. Because everyone probably was just looking around going like, oh, I'm not sure he's right, you know. Yeah, next up we had Sasha Banks taking on Emma. Emma with the jobber entrance. Yep, yep, she was already in the ring. Uh, what a fun little match. Well, both of them are excellent. Like, yeah. I think it can't be stated enough there. Sasha Banks is very, very good at wrestling. And Emma is very, very good at wrestling. She started the women's revolution. She, uh, apparently so. And hashtag Nikki Bella. <laughs> well, that's it. it she was... did, though. The Bellas did start the, the women's Well, it revolution. wasn't just the Bellas. It was Total Divas. The TV show started the women's revolution. No, no, no. It was Stephanie McMahon. No, I think even it if was you Stephanie are... McMahon and Mae Young. <laughs> They started it. I think if you ask Nikki Bella, she will tell you that it was Total Divas. It was everyone but Charlotte Page, <laughs> Becky Lynch and Bailey. I'm pretty sure. And uh, nothing nothing at all to do with Sarah Del Rey. And it was absolutely nothing to do with NXT or the Full Sail crowd. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, it, it, actually, let's just say it for what it is. It was Mae Young. <laughs> Mae Young started the women's revolution. She did. And really, she really kicked that off in 1999 yeah. when she was... Uh, actually, was Famous Mueller was champion in 1999. Mm. Can you believe that? Crazy times, isn't it? Uh, so, yes, we had Sasha Banks and Emma here. Maybe Emma's jobber entrance wasn't so much of a bad thing, considering her new music. Not good. Uh, and Alexa Bliss and Nia Jax were on commentary. Now, I had a little bit of a problem here with this, because didn't Nia Jax give her a huge electric chair drop and finally turn on her? Mm. They seemed quite pally here, and later on, with the Asuka promo, it cut back to them backstage, and Bliss was like, let's not let her steal our spotlight. You should be hating each other right now. I know. Spot it's, her like a fly, Jax. It's so, and like, cause it makes Nia Jax look like a complete moron, yeah. which is the last thing that she needs as the, as the dominant heel that's on the, uh, on the roster. It completely undercuts the really cool finish to Raw. Uh, after the Bliss Banks match, completely uh, several weeks ago, completely agree. But this was a, a, a good little match. But next up, um, this is probably my joint favorite moment. Oh man, WWE's been good the last couple of weeks. Really has. We've actually been it's pretty spoiled. Yeah, and I I must say, this this one is. I was going to say this is probably my favorite moment of the week, but then I thought, oh no, there was another one. Oh no, there was another one. So this is my this is my top joint top with two others yeah. for Raw and Smackdown. We're not counting the Mae Young Classic, uh, which was good. Uh, the was Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman did his usual spiel and said, you know what though? Like they do in the Broctagon. Fight! And he called out Braun Strowman. Braun of course came out because he, he's a monster. He is a monster and his music is so good. And they came out and they had a stare down. They got physical. Brock got the better of him for a moment. German suplex. For a moment, we're in New Japan. Braun Strowman just rolls over after the suplex, stands right back up. Brock's cocky, celebrating, turns back round. And they're just... The look on his face. He sold it so yeah. well. We've said it many times on this show, but when Brock is into a feud, man, is he great. And it just it felt like uh, the Goldberg stuff. It essentially is quite similar to the Goldberg stuff, yeah. but there's enough different about it. You know, uh, Paul had a great line about how good Bra- Braun is, you know, building up Strowman as Brock's competitor because he reminds him of Brock when Brock first broke into the business. Uh, I just thought that was a really nice parallel for Heyman to Yeah, draw. this this was a uh, great segment. A uh, really, really great segment. And that no sell specifically. Yes. Brock's, mm. Brock's, Brock's reaction was awesome. Yeah. The, there are a few things that get over with me like a no sell. I've ne- I've got I've watched a lot of it because I watch a lot of New Japan and it has not once gotten old with me. Mate, well if uh, if I'm you- sure WWE can find a way though. If in the poll tomorrow you do vote for Starcade 1997, you may get another reaction like that. Oh, is that is that a? I'm, I mean, I don't want to say anything, but I don't want to spoil anything for sure. you. Um, the oh, it's Sting, yes. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah when yeah. he bursts out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the one. That's great. I love a Sting though. So, uh, so next up, oh, at the end of that segment, Braun posed over Brock, 
with the belt. And one of my favourite things that wrestlers do when they, they just lay the belt on, mm. on their opponents, their laying down opponents, and just taps it a little bit. Just being like, hold on to that for me while uh, for a couple more weeks, will you? That wasn't a tap. <laughs> that was a chop. They were just slapped in like that. <laughs> That was a good slap. Next up, we had Bray Wyatt beating Goldust. Still living in the Titan Tron, cutting a promo. Yeah, even before he actually came out, but he started off in the Titan Tron. Yeah. Uh, this was this was just it's it's a it's a no good feud that's been extended okay. when it had a natural climax. And so that's the Bray Wyatt Finn Balor stuff. The idea is that Bray now doesn't like face paint and he's going after people with face paint on. And then just like the whole Nia Jax bliss undercutting of stuff that happened before, I hate it how WWE expect us to just accept Goldust coming out and wrestle a match. After all that stuff with R-Truth, after that protege thing, after the movie, and now he's a babyface. And he's a terrific worker and that, you know, he got over a bit like that. It was a dead crowd, but the bit at the end got some nice heat when Wyatt was wiping off the, the face paint from Goldust. But just put Jeff Hardy out there. Put him in the face paint. Can I defend this segment somewhat? Go on. Uh, You and I often criticise WWE. In fact, we do it all the time for doing the same thing week in, week out. And the Finn Balor-Bray Wyatt uh, feud has been more or less that, which was just like Balor would come out, I'm going to say a few things now about Bray Wyatt. And then Wyatt would show up on the Titan Tron, that's where he lives, and we'll cut a spooky promo. No one really cares. We built a boring match that no one really cares about. Um, at least this week, they did something different. And they did something, they did an angle that furthered the storyline. And that I can get behind. This idea that Bray Wyatt is now just saying, like, you put on this face paint, as Finn Balor does when he dresses up as the demon, mm. and you think it makes you someone else, but beneath you're just a man. And I can prove that you're just a man underneath that makeup. And so he used Gold Dust to make an example of. And I thought as per the storyline and furthering said storyline, it was a really effective angle. I will concede that. I I still didn't enjoy it. I will will concede that. It's like one of those things that works on paper. Yes. Like the, the story they're telling of Bray Wyatt wanting the demon to come out and he gets the demon out, but then he doesn't like the demon because he's beaten by him. So now he's all against the demon. That's like a nice story. But it is not being told in anything resembling an engaging way. No, and the uh, the problem actually that you highlighted quite eloquently is that Goldust has been a heel. Mm. And we've been conditioned over the last few months to know that he's a heel. So it was then hard to kind of boo Bray Wyatt for being up a heel. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was where it did fall down. Next up though, huge, huge announcement. Uh, I saw a lot of people like, oh, it's just Asuka. I think this is this, because what, I wrote uh, in the in the news major WWE debut or I guess technically a call up or main roster debut at least. I see Asuka as a major major player. She is, but it's just it's internet trolls, isn't it? It's just people trying to say things. It's like all those people no, that I say like so. that, 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 that go, ah, Shinsuke Nakamura is a bit overrated, really, and or he should be the most overrated wrestler in the the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards. Like it's it's people trying to say things to be contrarians. Uh, I think anyway because I genuinely cannot believe that there is no one that, uh, that any, she's so good hmm. like she is awesome <clears throat> she's something so special and she's so great I just find it baffling that someone would sit there and go like that's no, only Asuka well maybe they're not to, to explain that side I can I can see why uh, they if they're not familiar with her work mm-hmm. and they've just heard Asuka 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 but really they're it's, just an NXT person who's getting called up exactly and I think when you have this like Asuka's great Asuka's great Asuka's great this is she's a major star this that and the other you have those people who haven't watched NXT who just go like oh instantly I don't like her mm. she, well, it's the Roman Reigns being forced down my throat but what did you think about this promo as an inter- introduction to her well I, I hope that they are going to have different so- uh, store. <laughs> trying to get my words out there, different styles of promos for her. Because I like the idea of like the, the different masks and like the, the thing going back and forth. However, that... The pendulum blade. That it, was really nice. But it, it screams to me, oh yeah, Vince is in, is in charge of this, isn't he? And he looks at... He, he saw Asuka and was like, oh, do you know what? That, she's about the mask. Mm. So we need to make the mask her character. Whereas what if I was doing these promo packages, I would focus on the fact that she was the undefeated Asuka on NXT, never mm. been pinned, never been submitted. She's this unstoppable uh, women's uh, character, as opposed to being like, oh yeah, but she wears weird-ass masks, doesn't she? Let's focus on the masks. I, 
I, I mean, I, I, they definitely need to address that in the promos. That's I what hope I mean. They, they, I, I'm, I'm hoping that like next yeah. week's promo. I'm, I'm not judging this entire thing on just one promo. They've probably got about six more weeks of promos to run because she is injured. She can't get physical at the moment, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I thought this was, I thought this was a good day, de- uh, debut promo at least. It, she, it did creep me out, and I just hope. It's not going to be the Funkasaurus <laughs> at the end of it. Or an Emelina where it just never, never transpires. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, after that, we had the Bliss and Nia Jax buddy thing backstage that we've already yeah, spoken th- about. And I, actually, I, I, the other <laughs> thing I really didn't like about this moment was that it cuts backstage and it's Nia Jax watching the, uh, the, 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 the promo announcement on TV. She just completely no-sold it. Yeah. And I think that that does a lot of damage to the Asuka character when they just all walk up and be like, look, Asuka's coming to take our spot. No, she's not coming to take your spot. She's coming to kill you all because she yeah. is the unstoppable, undefeated Asuka. Be scared. You're yeah, meant to be to scared. It. Yeah, if you had someone interviewing her and Bliss pulls off the thing where she's like, I'm not I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of someone from NXT. I used to, you know, NXT's nothing to me. And But she is quite visibly scared. And then something falls over in the background. Mm. <laughs> And she she gets rattled and she has a jump start. Perfect. Yeah, that 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 would be a way around that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next up, we had Elias doing his usual mocking your hometown. I proper laughed though, and I laugh every time. People were clapping along for this one. <laughs> until he then could. And it, it make, I, this is what I love about American wrestling audiences because they're like, "Oh, it's a song, clap along with the song," and he's like. Anaheim sucks. Oh, 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 oh boo! Oh, no, boo! I'm not going to clap anymore. Like every, he suckers them in every time. It's wonderful. It's such lovely cheap heat. And, uh, you know, this is somebody who does the same thing every week. Every I week. do not mind it. No, really. <laughs> I kind of... I don't look forward to it, but I definitely don't object to it being on on the show. Yeah. Poor old, uh, uh, although, poor old Kalisto. Like... Why isn't he in 205 Live? Mm. Why? Uh, you took him over to Raw to, to do what? Be. Oh, okay. I say be beat up by Braun Strowman. He does have a victory over He's Braun Strowman. Got a victory, yeah. Few people have that on him. <laughs> and one of them is Kalisto. But he just comes out with his like little crappy, like tight, whatever his flappy things is that he's got around his um, shorts. And just gets beaten up and just loses. He's just, he, and he's got awful music. He's just the worst. I thought this was a, re- a pretty decent match. Oh, really? I, I'm, I'm pretty I, a boring match. I know. Maybe something was off with me that that uh, when I watched Raw because I thought the the Cena match with Jordan was better. I thought this was the second coming of Steamboat uh, <laughs> Savage. <laughs> I just, I, I thought, uh, you know, the way Elias wrestles is very slow, methodical. He's just mainly rest holds, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And that really, I, I found that dynamic playing off really well against Kalisto, who's all about explosive, high flying moves. I, I enjoyed the match, but uh, the other thing I will concede if people didn't. No, the only other thing I will mention is that they were putting over uh, very hard that Kalisto's mask was going up for auction. He was wearing a gold masking uh, for Connor's Cure, a very good mm. uh, charity, uh, trying to beat something that's very, very horrible. But I did things like, who's going to want it, though? Because, like, yeah. he's a jobber chump. Who wants to buy... Like, you wouldn't want to buy the Brooklyn Brawlers T-shirt, would you? Is you... it solid gold? I don't think it's solid gold. I well, mean... It could be a good resale value. <laughs> What do you mean, like the Atari? I was about to make a very deep cut. Then I was like, "Oh, like the Atari um, uh, Sword Quest series." Where uh, do you know the Atari Sword Quest series? That's, yeah, <laughs> the, that was that's, that's deep cut. We'll put that in the podcast. The story. Uh, so John Cena was up next in a pay per view caliber match against Braun Strowman. Yep. Uh, John Cena joins Callisto with <laughs> victories over Braun Strowman. Yeah, this was um this was a very very good match because do you know who's great at selling a giant match? Big match John. Yeah. Big match John knows how to work with giants. He's so good at it. Big match scruffy head John. <laughs> scruffy head John. His hair is so Throwing scruffy. Oh, he's a so scruffy fella. Scruffy lad. The I, I really enjoyed this match. Yeah. I really like the story they were telling where Cena tried a few times to hit the AA. I think I would, if you were going to have a DQ finish, I would have just not had the AA play into it. Mm. Uh, you know, you save that for a future match. But he did hit the AA, but Braun rolled out the ring. So it's kind of an argument that's protected. But I, just, I wouldn't have given that spot. Perhaps this is a story not, say, uh, not you know, talked about for this time, and we can save this for a future episode. But do you feel like we're nearing the end of John Cena's time in WWE? Yeah. 
because it feels like they are cycling through these big pay-per-view matches that oh, we yeah, could Nakamura be building. Well. Nakamura, we've had Braun Strowman, we've had Roman Reigns, George, Jason Jordan. All these matches that are like first-time matches that could be really built up to. And it really does feel that because Cena's going away for a while mm. after No Mercy, the rumours he's coming back at the Royal Rumble... But it really just feels that like, let's, we need to get through all these matches now. We need to get the most most yeah. out of John because soon he'll be gone, and then we won't be able to get to have these matches ever again. Well, when he was up before he returned in the brand split that July Fourth thing, he was asked expressly about that, and he his reply was, "This isn't WWE. This is something I requested to be able to appear on both brands to have as many matches with as many young guys as possible." Mm, yeah, and so that plays exactly in exactly. Wh- whether he's just retconning a, a stupid decision by WWE. Oh yeah, but it's it's just you using his star power to kind of make yeah. other people appear on his level. And that's very good. Anyway, as fun as this match was, and as much as it did leave in the tank for a an actual big pay-per-view clash between them later on, uh, it did have a stupid finish <laughs> where Braun hit John with the steel steps. And I was like, well, that's the match over, right? The referee isn't doing anything. Is it post-traumatic stress from the ring collapsing all those months ago? And then... So I thought, okay, maybe they're just calling it off and they're not going to ring the bell or anything. But then Braun got him back into the ring, did the running power slam finish on John onto the steel steps, which, if anything, is a less... I know it's a more aggressive move, but the steps are there on the ground. Yeah, they just... You're not picking... You're not throwing them at someone. They just happen to be in the way of you doing a move. Yeah, but the... That was the DQ. I just thought it was a, I thought a it was weird a bit, it was a bit odd, And I think a lot of people were a bit confused about that because someone sent me a message going like, was that match no DQ? And I was like, no, that's why it ended in a DQ. Mm. But yeah, it should have ended. And Corey Graves even said on commentary because they showed a replay of Braun hitting him with the steel stairs. And Corey Graves just went, I mean, it should have ended there in a DQ. Yeah, that was that was a bizarre... You know, because they plot these, especially Braun Strowman, John Cena matches. I imagine that is plotted out to the spot. Why? How does that slip through the cracks? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, next up, you know, I said I had three favourite things this week. Of course, the first one was the Braun Strowman no sell. The second one, I did not see this coming, came in a Miz TV segment with Enzo Amore. So the way this uh, segment ran down was Miz came out with his Miz Taraj and announced he was a baby face for all of two minutes here. He announced that his wife and him, Maurice, were expecting a baby. And the crowd were genuinely behind them. I had a big heart swell. I was happy for them. I've written my notes here. That's adorable. Yeah, and uh, Miz got out a pre-prepared statement and said, I've got something to read. From what I... If I'm trying to defend WWE here, it seemed to me that Miz got this out and was meant to go too schmaltzy and eventually get people booing him because, you know, like, I can't wait, you know, like, I'm so happy with me and Maurice. I'm so lucky to have a wife who's so much prettier than anybody else's wives here today. Yeah. My kid's going to be so much better than all of your kids and the stupid kids at ringside. You know, you play... I That's where I thought they were going to go with this. But they didn't. No. <laughs> Enzo Amore just interrupted them about 20 seconds into the still <laughs> heartfelt bit. Like a total heel. Like, a, I've written in my notes, what a heel, what yeah. a dick. Like, it's just, I couldn't believe it. Like, Enzo Mori started just coming out and started cutting this promo, and I was like, this was a really nice moment, mm. and you've ruined it. Like, you, what, a, what a horrible person. And to your point, I wonder if it's a rib on Enzo. Yeah. And the, that was the plan, and that was in the Miz's speech, was to be able to, like, cut this promo and say, like, your kids at ring ties are dumb, this, that, and the other. But Vince is there going, like, play the music early. Yeah, Play I wouldn't be surprised. Send 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 Enzo out now. I I had I had thought that as well before you. Because I, I this was such an odd segment, mm. because then this just it devolved into this this shoot, in inverted commas shoot, uh, segment where the Miz was saying all these truths about uh, about Enzo Amore, and I was like. Oh, but again, you're coming off like the baby face mm. because you're defending your your pregnant wife's honor, and this horrible little man has come out here to insult this unborn child yeah and this very nice lady the other problem with this which is probably because this this didn't get much of a reaction mrs shoot promo it was just the latest that i think people are a bit shoot burnt out now which is crazy because you know for the longest time i think we've both been wanting more realism can, in wwe can i um put forward <laughs> my two cents on this and perhaps 
give give my my internal reasoning for why the crowd didn't react as much as they have for the Cena Rain stuff. So the Cena Rain stuff is all it's all very cosmetic stuff. Everyone who watches Raw knows that Roman Reigns gets booed. Like that's not a secret. Roman Reigns comes out, boo, thunderous ovation, the thunderous boovation. No one likes him. And then, but the commentators going like, he's the big dog. He's the big guy. He's leading this place. Mm-hmm. So when John Cena then comes out and be like, you're not the big dog. Everyone doesn't like you. The com- this company is pushing and they're strapping a rocket to you. People can see that and they can get behind it. Yeah. The Enzo and Miz one, and this kind of comes back to something that was a big criticism of WCW when Vince Russo was booking. Back in 1999, 2000, Vince Russo was obsessed with the internet. Mm. Was obsessed with the internet. And uh, dirt sheets and smart fans and just being like, oh, that's what wrestling is. That's who watches wrestling. It's all these smart fans. Whereas, realistically, in 1999, 2000, the actual percentage of people who were reading dirt sheets and like were on the internet was quite small mm. i'd say probably like you know maybe 20 percent of the people who were like not, not even that high to be honest it's more no. like like five ten percent oh oh i think even less. lower than that especially because yeah. you had a bigger audience then yeah I, that's very so true because, yes I, I i would say you know like one two percent maybe yeah. even better okay so i see uh, even even better then so but vince russo thought that that's what the entire audience was so he would then write in the storylines about based off of backstage feuds and would mention things that have been reported in dirt sheets and then expect like a huge reaction because I was like, oh, he's going to know that he's talking about that time that Scott Steiner brought a knife to uh, to the backstage area. But no one in the audience knows that because they just see the wrestlers that are out there. Mm. And I think that, again, kind of ties into this Enzo thing where he's like, that's why you're thrown off the bus. The amount of people in that audience who know that story is probably very small in in yeah. comparison to the actual larger audience. A, the only larger audience that are watching at home, but B, the audience audience that's in the arena. I completely agree. That's it. It went too inside baseball. It's too inside baseball. Cage side seats had uh, their review of this show had a good line where it was like it was it was a little bit Vince Russo, and you don't even want to be a little bit Vince Russo. You don't even <laughs> want to have a little bit of that. Uh, so, uh, I, that uh, that's where I felt that this fell down. Yeah, definitely. I would have. Uh, I don't think I would have done it because I still think it harms Enzo and I think there's money in Enzo but if you feel so strongly about burying a guy like that in the ring Miz should have just explained the story you know to, you know what everyone in the crowd here let me tell you a little story about Enzo Amore perfect explain and then, it explain to it. Them. then it's just not a weird line which gets a, a confused reaction because it's you know that would have been a much way better way of doing it. We know about it. We can that one two percent of smart fans who read this stuff can hook in, and then everyone else is in on the gag as well. Anyway, it, this, didn't, it didn't work for me. Yeah, this did, however, turn into quite a fun segment by the end of it. Yeah, because then they had a match where they were kind of like still cutting promos on each other yeah, throughout yeah, the fun. match, and again, once again. Miz came off as such a her- heroic babyface, and Enzo came off as the biggest dick heel. I don't know. I thought this was a money line. I thought Enzo, when Enzo was firing back, I kind of uh, I got behind him. He's so good on the mic that I, I do start to root for him, even though Miz was. He's a very good at cutting lot, an impassioned yeah. promo, and I did like that. Even though Miz was definitely in the morally right, I the kept the charisma took me Enzo's way. But the the money line here, they had this, you know, like you said, the fun match where they're kind of cutting promos on each other on the mic while wrestling. Ended with Enzo saying to Miz, don't be asking your child how you doing. Be asking who's your daddy. And it just, the, that got the biggest reaction on the crowd. Like the yeah. biggest genuine guttural reaction. Yeah. Because people were just amazed that they said that. Enzo was immediately dragged out the ring by the Miz Taraj. Okay, up. so for example, imagine if uh, the Miz and Maurice had announced on Twitter that they were pregnant, or it had been reported mm. in like the Wrestling Observer that they were pregnant, or we, and we'd reported it on Wrestle Talk News. But WWE hadn't said anything about it on TV, and then they still had that line. No one would have reacted to it yeah. because no one would have known what he's talking about. Yeah, you got it's it's like a joke. You have the feed line, which is sort of the explanation and the setup, which was Miz's opening part of that promo and then you have the payoff the, yeah, the punchline which exactly. is Enzo's line uh, just one last thing on this segment apart from the fact that this is the first time a cruiserweight wrestler has wrestled a, a plus 205 live gu- guy so, someone did try and say that you were wrong in oh, the conversation yesterday was it? well someone said that um, well Jack Gallagher was in the Royal Rumble uh, that's, which doesn't really count yeah I guess so but on yeah 
take for that what you will, is someone suggested on Reddit, I can't remember who, but in nine months' time, it should be revealed that Bo Dallas is the dad. <laughs> You what a swerve you that would be! Didn't even keep the Miseraj around for that yeah. long. Oh, yeah, good point. Uh, finally, very quickly, because there was not much here, the main event was uh, Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins and the Hardy Boys versus Sheamus Cesaro and Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. See, now you said there's not a lot to say, but this was actually almost a show long storyline mm. because you had it was meant to be Shimaro versus Gal Anderson, and you had um, Death out on commentary, who were Death on commentary yeah. because. I love these lads. They made me hate them on commentary. Because you got Seth Rollins just saying stupid, like, smarmy things. And then you got Wacky Dean getting out his binoculars and his notepad. He's like, oh my god, is that real leather? It's real leather. It's made of real leather. He's so funny. He's so wack. Oh, I was like, oh my god, get these two off TV. Yeah. Do- I can't believe they turned me on Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose by just making them unlikable people. But then, like, it became this sort of tag team warfare thing, and it was awesome because you had all these three teams fighting against each other. And I was like, ah, oh, yes, this is good. This, this is kind of shaking things up a little mm. bit from the usual standard tag team formula. Liking this. There was also a promo backstage but with Sheamus and Cesaro that I thought was all right, although I did realise from this, and I don't know if I've just missed this previously, but um, Sheamus is a Liverpool fan, so instantly he's now the biggest heel on the planet for me. Um, Nothing like blind loyalty. (laughs) It's nothing like blind loyalty. And then there's... And this was a moment I literally screamed at my uh, laptop while I was watching this. Mm. So Seth and Dean are backstage with Kurt Angle, and Kurt Angle says, like, oh, you need to go find tag team partners. And Dean's like, oh, I'll find him. I'll go to Disneyland and I'll get Mickey Mouse or Batman. And I just shouted, I was like, well, you're not going to find Mickey Mouse. Ma- you're not going to find Batman at Disney World, are you? Warner Brothers own him, you doofus. He's not going to be there, is he? Really annoyed me anyway. Yeah, I bet it did. Yeah, <laughs> it did. see, it seems. Because, because I that- can see your all caps notes that you've written down. Because you won't it- find Batman at Disneyland, you effing doofus. Because you have it- actually <laughs> written down in capitals in your notes. Because then it comes to Kurt Angle going like, Batman would be a good tag team partner. I was like, well, yeah. he would be, but you're not going to find him at Disney World. And that is just, that's WWE writing just not knowing anything mm. and just being like oh we'll just put that in because that's a funny pop culture reference i i agree about the commentary and this i don't want to you know because this is essentially the shield i don't want to see the shield pigeonholed not pigeonholed but forced into this square that they are round peg going into this square hole of comedy baby faces that wwe have been obsessed with since the astounding success of the rock and I don't want them out there acting goofy on commentary. So annoying. I want them being serious. They're the shield. They're tormented. <laughs> and we've gone from brotherly hate and love at the same time relationship to, yeah, like you said, wacky Dean Ambrose. Wacky Dean Ambrose. It was, it was uh, the worst. Mm. But uh, they they were looking for tag team partners, uh, which eventually became the Hardys. But there was a nice moment when they ran into Dean Malenko and, I did uh, pop for Dean, especially Jamie Noble, especially when Dean Ambrose goes, "It's the man of a thousand holes." Yeah, yeah. And then and Seth Rollins, in a nice bit of continuity callback, just went, "Oh hi, Jay." I once uh, <laughs> that was really nice. I I once worked with a guy who I tried to convince that Dean Malenko was my uncle, but um, uh, he never believed me. Mm. But I kept it up for the entire time I worked with him. To the, which was like several years. Like I never admitted it to the extent where I'd I put a signed picture of Dean Am- uh, Dean Ambrose Dean Malenko in in like his work folder. I was like, oh, that's mine. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> it was just yeah. I I do something every couple of months just to just to f with his head. But- slight slight uh, rambling tangent. Yeah. I once uh, chatted a girl up in a bar in my uh, teenage years. I remember my early twenties uh, where I convinced her uh, throughout the entire night that my name was Chevy Chase. Nice. Yeah. She she wasn't familiar. She with knew, Chevy she, Chase. she knew who Chevy Chase was. Oh, but you were like, it's just, it's annoying. Yeah, I get it all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, I said no, I, my name, my full name was Chevy Chase Owen. Um, my parents just really liked National Lampoon's mm. Christmas Vacation and just named me after Chevy Chase. Was it successful? Did you? Uh, no, I did not. No, did I not mean, convert, no, I, I did. No, I did not. Oh, um, remarkably so, because mm. I was trying to convince a girl that my name was Chevy Chase. Yeah. In fact, now it's a restraining order. The opposite of a conversion. <laughs> but it's okay because it's uh, restricting Chevy Chase Owen, which I'm not. Perfect. Legal loophole. <laughs> the The main event, though, was fun. It was just... Uh, it was throwaway. D- Dean... Uh, the, the, the baby faces won. But, um, yeah, it was... Considering that you had John Cena and Braun Strowman earlier, 
that's what this night should have ended on. Yeah, totally. But there's competition with the NFL and whatnot, so, you know. Yeah, it was the only other thing to, to mention in this was that, because uh, a few people mentioned that, or were annoyed that you didn't bring it up in the Raw review, but um, Matt Hardy did trip over the ropes and did, yes. miss, did make uh, miss breaking up the pinfall. And as I've written here, broken, more like botching. It's a SmackDown review, Magala, I love it. We got us a flying Uso. SmackDown was also a strong affair, mm. I thought. It was built up the previous week. I thought last week's episode was terrific, and it built up really well this Las Vegas episode, almost like a mini pay-per-view, which is what really has to be done when you've got this huge gap between pay-per-views. You've got SummerSlam, and then uh, Hell in a Cell is like middle of October. Yeah, it's not till next month. So that's... A, that's an almost two month build to your next pay per view. So, this is essentially their no mercy to, to fill in that time slot. Uh, and it opened pretty hot with Kevin Owens calling out Vince McMahon, but Vince McMahon didn't come. Daniel Bryan was like, he'll be here later in the show. But it did lead Owens to just do some fantastic heel like jokes and references. There was, a, he said that when he does sue SmackDown and get control of SmackDown. It's going to become the Kevin Owens show. He uh, he said the first thing you do is fire Sami Zayn. You know, even in the middle of this main event feud, he's like, yep, Sami Zayn, I'm still going to really bully you and not like you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said he's going to cancel the fashion files. He told Byron Saxton and Tom Phillips to wear the same suit. Literally one suit for both of them because you sound the same, which is pretty fun. Uh, you put, you pointed out a Jimmy Jacobs line that I didn't pick up on. Yeah, it was later. It was backstage when he was going through like the list of uh, things that he needed once he'd taken over. And he said, and I... I actually wrote in my notes here, someone's been wa- uh, watching Fantasy Booking Warfare because he was literally like, we need to change the top of the show. We need to put more like a new theme song and this mm. and the other. But he did say, he's like, uh, I'm going to need a limo uh, for my family to come to the arena. Oh, actually, can you? Uh, I need a limo for my friend Jimmy, which I, which I popped at, but you uh, I missed I completely that. missed it. I completely missed it. But the, the reference is Jimmy Jacobs works backstage for WWE now. He was part of Ring of Honor for a long time and part of Kevin Owens' former faction Scum with Steve mm. Carino, a great little act. Uh, but this was it was all fun I but you've got to, like I said at Fantasy Booking Warfare at the weekend there is so so much potential for giving Kevin Owens the whole show for just a couple of weeks yeah. in this storyline and this this was a tease of what it could be it's such a fruitful concept but I, I can't see them doing it no I don't I think they will either I, but I, I I would love it if they do and I won't sue myself for copyright or gimmick infringement. They're smart people. I think Kevin Owens can come up with these good ideas separately of watching Wrestle Ramble. I agree. Uh, but please watch it. I love you, Kevin Owens. I'm a really big fan. <laughs> anyway, next up, we had the first of three championship matches that were uh, built the previous week. So these were all announced in advance to make it feel like a pay-per-view. And this big announced pay-per-view mini pay-per-view of sorts AJ Styles versus Ty Dillinger US Open US title open challenge they went seven minutes yeah this needed so much more time yeah. um, my I think my big feedback I would give uh, my big criticism I suppose I should say for, for Smackdown this week was that I'd have just had these three matches just build those three matches yeah. and then don't bother with doing um, the, the Hype Brothers match you had at the end there Um Oh, God, that was the only other match. No, get rid of Dolph Ziggler's segment. Oh, yeah, well. get rid of that Dolph Ziggler segment. Yeah, we'll come on to that. Probably get rid of the Jinder promo. Yep, exactly. I'd have just had the... And this could have had, like, 15, 20 minutes, and it would have been so much better mm. because that near fall off the tiebreaker was absolutely yeah. awesome. And Tom Phillips, to his credit, was, was so good at selling how AJ Styles managed to kick out that move. He's like, usually he gets to pull down the knee pad, but it was a reactionary move. He didn't get all of it. That, and uh, if he'd have just been able to throw down the knee pad, we'd have a new US champion. So clever, like in, in, in covering up how he managed to kick out his finishing move. That was a great call. Similar to Corey Graves and the DQ one the previous night. It's just... Makes your announcers sound credible. Yes. Novel concept for WWE. About that uh, seven-minute match, by the way, it was actually four minutes of TV time. Yeah, I was going to say three minutes of it were in. So we only got to see a four-minute match. And the the benefit of the US title, Open Challenge, is that underutilized guys can prove themselves and get over with the crowd and management, probably, in these these 10, 15-minute matches. But we haven't... This was just... This was a complete waste. I was so disappointed with this. I was very disappointed too. This was... Even though there were worse things on the show, 
this was the worst thing for me just because of how much I was looking forward to a Dillinger Styles match. Completely to agree. To just go a full 15 minutes. And it's the second time they've done it as well because when they did the first AJ um, Dillinger match, that only went like four minutes as well of, of actual yeah. TV time. And we said then, ah, but the rematch, they'll give it more time we'll be able yeah. to actually have the proper match. But nope, not this time. Corbin interfered at like an absolute goof. <clears throat> and AJ just took him out with a phenomenal forearm and then still beat Ty in a very short amount of time that was problematic credit to uh, Ty as well um, when Corbin was doing his beat down uh, Ty still continued to sell his leg from the uh, calf crusher yeah that constantly was constantly holding it very good what a professional uh, next up we had Jinder Mahal cutting a promo Ooh. oh Ooh. no oh I'm sorry first of all we was, have, have I missed something you have you have missed the backstage segment with Rusev and the the new oh, robot yeah. lady this robot lady this she's amazing she is so bad at her job. Yeah. It's astounding how bad she is at that job. No emotion. Dead behind the eyes. Wow. That sure was a match between AJ Styles and Ty Dillinger. It's like all just like programmed. No inflection in anything. Mm. It was incredible. It's worth watching. If you haven't watched SmackDown, watch it just for this interview. This robot lady. It was Their robotics division is incredible these days. Yeah, they have managed to make uh, some form of artificial intelligence. <laughs> but it's not... It's, they just it, need to work on uh, personality now. I, I think... I think... If I'm trying to find an explanation here, WWE has this mindset of not letting anyone but the performers get heat. That's why... Uh, referees aren't really mentioned by name or given personalities anymore or really allowed to like go, no, no, like I'll have no use to do. Uh, it's why D Justin Roberts wasn't allowed to do all the stuff. He was just told, no, go out there. The audience ho only has so much reaction in them. So just announce them. Don't do any of this frilly stuff that you were doing either. Don't get over. <laughs> it's the performers who get over. And maybe that's, they're just, maybe it's they're just things that I disagree with it very fundamentally, but as, because you can, I, I, you can play off like imagine like Kevin Kelly do you remember when he used to do interviews yeah. or, or, or the gold standard Mean Gene I was about to say I don't want to go back into the like back in the old day but like when Mean Gene did interviews it's a pro the people got over because Mean Gene wasn't just saying like my guest at this time Hulk Hogan it'd be like Hulk Hogan you've got this amazing match coming up here why don't you tell me what's going on and Hulk Hogan would say something and Mean Gene would react to it with a follow up question mm. And then that would require the Hulk then to think on his feet and say something back and further a storyline, further his character. And it made Mean Gene seem like a, an actual interviewer as opposed to just a, a cardboard cutout. They may as well just have cardboard cutouts down yeah. there with just with like the, the question written on them. So the rest of just walk up, read the question and answer it. Well, that's the problem. The, the, they use their backstage interviews. Rena Young just about get, gets around it because she's got so much personality. But it's just as a prompt. Yeah. Like, here's the question. Now you can do a monologue looking off into the middle distance. Whereas back in the day, they were conversations. or not. It was an interview, but it was much more conversational. Mean Gene would be the sort of... the the portal through which we could be outraged at the heel. He'd be like, well, why did you do that? That wasn't yeah, right. Absolutely. And, and then, you know, the, they've got more to play off of. Ugh. She, uh, as I said, if you haven't watched SmackDown, watch it just for this lady. She was incredibly bad at her job. But it might not be her fault. That's that's just the direction she's been given. But Rene Young manages it. <laughs> uh, Jinder Mahal promo. Um, yeah. So mm. the problem with Shinsuke Nakamura is that he's not American. So Jinder can't come out and say, you hate me because you're American. I mean, he's Japanese. So he tried his hand at some commentary, which Vince McMahon was definitely like backstage. It was about poop. It was about being constipated. Oh, my God, this promo. This was, this was awful. This was absolutely awful. You want to get this man over as, uh, as, as WWE champion? Don't don't hand him stuff like this because this is not getting him over. This was so it wasn't it wasn't even mid card. It was like the European title. Oh, the, yeah, the belt that, beneath yes. the title. Absolutely, that's you've hit the nail right on the head there. This was just dr dreadfully bad. I can't even find the words to say how awful this was. Now, it wasn't it wasn't completely terrible because the Singh brothers are, are, in, are brilliant. Them falling about laughing at stuff that wasn't funny in itself is kind of funny. I, on a, 
I thought the Singh brothers in particular, it, and this isn't the first time they have been the, the scene stealer of a Jinder Mahal segment. Mm-hmm. You know, the Punjabi prison, the bump off the thing, but all of the Randy Orton punishment that he inflicted on them. And that last week as well, as they were crying and begging, like, we're yeah. so sorry we uh, failed you at SummerSlam, Maharaja. They're, they're so good. Very, They are excellent lackeys. I wish they were a tag team, like an active tag yeah. team. Uh, the other actually thing that I kind of want to mention about this promo, <laughs> in what almost worked, and but they didn't follow up on this. There was this moment, so, like, so Jinder's there, and he's saying, like, oh, Nakamura, um, people think he's the artist. Let's have a look at some of his work. And it's Nakamura pulling funny faces. And they're like, oh, look, he looks like he's constipated. What silly face he's pulling. He's got a weird face. Look mm. at him. What a weird face. And then after all that, he said, Nakamura, there are people laughing at you the same way that they laugh at me because these Americans do not appreciate us as outsiders. And I suddenly went, oh, that's your point of your promo. Okay, brilliant. And then he was like, "Uh, Electrify Pikachu, Godzilla. And I'm like, oh, no, so that wasn't your point then. Mm. I don't know what your point was then. Yeah, it's it's it was bad all the way round because it wasn't good when he was doing the uh, non-anti-US stuff. And when he was doing the anti-US stuff, it was muddled and didn't work really. Didn't really work, no. You know, like, I think because I think his point was, you don't you don't want to become WWE champion because these people will treat you like how I've just treated you. You're like, that's not the point. <laughs> why are you trying to dissuade him? Like, yeah. I, I don't get I don't... Why, you, why you would even say that. Yeah, it didn't work. And like, I guarantee you... You're, th- you're combat athletes. <laughs> I guarantee you as well that this is not going to be brought up again next week. It probably won't be used yeah. in the video packages when they hype up their match at Hell in the Cell. Also, just a line on commentary, Nakamura's not here this week. He's a, he's away like representing the country in Japan or just just anything. Just to explain why Nakamura didn't come out and beat the hell out of him. No Nakamura, no Bobby Roode, no, no Randy. Randy Orton, no Fashion Files or Fashion Police. They were on Two Hundred Five Live quite brilliantly though. Oh man, Do check out that segment. Yeah, it's for the first time since working here full time. We actually watched a bit of Two Hundred Five Live. We watched a cumulatively, uh, I'd say three minutes worth of Two Hundred Five Live. We watched the the Fashion Files interrupting Drew Gulak. Which was very funny, was and the, uh, the the Jack Gallagher heel turn because I guess that was needed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and now he'll get over. New Day versus the Usos in our second championship match. Uh, what a fun match! What a great match this was. I loved this. These two work so well together, man. Yeah. Like they're just they're so good. It really nicely played the finish uh, when you know when uh, so at SummerSlam in the brilliant almost match of the night. Uh, match the the Usos won by continuous super kicks on Big E and then they did the double splash and they did that in this match they went up for the double splash but Kofi pushed one Uso through a table and then the the new day won and I tell you what the the way uh, the other I hate saying this but the way that the other Uso sold it mm. Like, so, like, you just pushed my brother off and threw a table. Yeah, because he scrambled all the way over to the ring, I am, completely forgot about Big E. I'm going to kill you now. Yeah, It yeah. was so great. What an awesome finish. Loved this match. I love everything about this match. But it's like their feud has had a second wind, because after the rap battle, it was a bit like, oh, we're just doing the same thing over and over. But SummerSlam was such a good match, and now they're just having really good matches every time. My star of the show, star of this match was Big E. Mm. Big E was all over this match, and it was like his selling was awesome, his comeback was awesome. Man, I like what a star! And new tag team champs, and new tag team champions, yeah, pretty, pretty uh, momentous. I think that they definitely had to change one of the titles. They built this show up. Mm. You know, I mean, they only built it up like a week, but like they built this show up a week long. They had to change at least one of the cha- uh, one of the titles, and I think the tag titles was probably the best one to change. I would have, and then this is gonna sound crazy. I would have given it to Ty because of Baron interference and set up a three-way program between them. Yeah, that'd have been good. That would have been because as, it's, as it's, much but I love it's hot shot in the US belt again. It's hot shot in the tag team titles. Yeah, no, but we haven't hot shot. We've been hot shot in the US one all year. Mm, so good point. have a referee bad decision in there as well. For good <laughs> uh, unfortunately, so New Day versus the Usos. I that's another as fun as it was. It's another match I could have done with more time of. Mm-hmm. It was eleven minutes by my count. Uh, Natalia versus Naomi. This was the longest built match. It was announced two weeks ago backstage. So, you know, I thought this was going to be a big thing. Maybe even have Carmella cash in at the end. Five minutes. Five minutes. And it was not a good match. And once again, Naomi bloody telegraphing the end with a bloody sour face because she was. Once again, just like, just 
telegraphs everything because she's just got the sour face in it because she's not mm. winning. I don't know, man. Like, I really like Naomi. I think she's got a great, great character and an amazing entrance, and she's awesome in the ring. But I just, I just look at her entrance. I, I just look at the way that she has her name announced. I'm like, okay, cool. I know if you're winning or losing now. Following that match, we had Dolph Ziggler doing his entrance thing again. He did Bailey and the Ultimate Warrior. It was fine, but you know, like we said before, you can just have given the other matches more time. Dolph already had his moment in the opening segment. Yeah, I mean, I pretty much just wrote here. Uh, that segment was the drizzling poops. Drizzling poops. Did you actually write that or did you no, use a different word? I used word? a different word. Yeah, I thought you might have. Yeah, Potty mouth. It was no good. Uh, then we had Chad Gable and Shelton Benjamin taking on the Hype Bros. Two and a half minutes. Another, you know, really quick match. But that's kind of okay because you're trying to get this new tag team over. The most noteworthy thing was Zach, apart from Chad Gable's arm not being long enough to make the the, the tag, mm. and Zach Ryder screaming, bellowing the spot, go back, go back, go back. He was helping the other team, and then yeah, Zach Ryder turns heel at the end. Not turns heel, but he he didn't engage in the post match handshake like Rawley did. We're picking up that story from about eight weeks ago. Yeah, well, it was a long time. That's long term planning, and it's worse when <laughs> WWE. You know, you love long term planning, but sometimes WWE just like. Long-term planning means we're going to give you one angle here and then the next angle three months ago. Yeah. See Triple H versus Seth Rollins. And finally, the big segment. This What what a t- twist and turning segment from a narrative that was told throughout the night with Kevin Owens saying he's going to own the show. The return after four years away from WWE television, Vince McMahon. Sorry, Mr. McMahon. Vince McMahon has been on television. Mr. McMahon returned. And uh, he, he addressed Owens's concerns, the Owens, the, the lawsuit stuff against Shane. And Vince said, in what I think is a not very thinly veiled reference to CM Punk's current lawsuit against Dr. Chris Amann, because uh, there's been some reports recently about how much money it's costing Punk and Cabana. Just so happens, Mr. McMahon says when he's talking to Kevin Owens, if you try and sue me, I'm a billionaire and I, my legal team will just just draw this out for years and years and years and then the only B next to your name will be bankrupt and I like as soon as he was as he was saying it, I thought this is very similar to the CM Punk situation right now and then is uh, that's inside a baseball that kind of works yeah because I as I I'm not really up on the whole CM Punk uh, WWE thing because mm. I don't really care and um, so that line just went over me and I was just like that's just Mr. McMahon saying a line. And it was a line that made sense within the context of the promo. It kind of made sense. but And, and I know Vince McMahon is a long-term heel. Surprise, surprise, he's acting a bit heelish. It would be weird if he didn't. But you that you started off as a baby face saying, you know, you hurt Shane, yada, yada, yada. And then you just, it's almost like he just had to get this dig in there. And he turned heel for a bit. And then he went back to I being. That was, a, wasn't a heel thing to do. I don't know. Like talking saying, about how much money you have. Yeah, I know. But like, but the the punchline of that was just that you're going to be bankrupt if you try and sue me. That to me was a baby face thing of just being like, don't try and step up mm. to me because I'll ruin you. I and, think, as, and making the heel look silly in the process. Yeah, I, but I think if anyone ever brings up about how much money they've got, that's an automatic heel side of the spectrum. Agreed. But Vince McMahon does live in a bubble where I mean, because you know he he's mates with Donald Trump. Like they don't yeah. they don't know that sort of thing. It's um, the Iron Fist argument. But this it ended with Vince saying, "I'm going to book you in a match then against Shane at Hell in a Cell." And if Shane wins, he gets his job back. I think that was the sti- was that the stipulation. Oh, I don't know if that was the stipulation. Uh, I can't right? remember. Uh, it was a bit weird that Kevin Owens just agreed to it. I wasn't. I don't think he had a choice. Yeah, I guess you could make an argument for that. Uh, but the 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 really cool thing was how Kevin Owens did agree to it. He said that so you, if I beat up a McMahon, I'm gonna be fine in the company. You're not gonna fire me. You know uh, the insinuation is that he's going to beat up Shane loads and he's not going to be reprimanded afterwards. Mm. Vince says, yes, you've got my word. They shake hands and Kevin Owens delivers such a stiff headbutt to Vince. Full on. It was, mate, stiff as a D. It was like, it will knock your D still. Like He just headbutted him so hard. And as soon as he hit the ground and his welt just grew up, uh, just started groaning his face instantly. Yeah. And then blood poured. I was like, I knew that headbutt was hard, 
but it was so much harder than I thought it was. Yeah, incredibly hard. And like you said, it busted the Vince McMahon open the hard way, which is crazy. It is a bit like, I loved it. I really, really loved this angle. Uh, I know Brian Alvarez has criticised it for being very... Uh, reckless considering what happened to Shabbat earlier yeah, this year I, off of a headbutt spot. And I, I kind of wish we could dive into that a little bit more, but we're a bit pressed for time. Yeah. We're kind of running long on this episode as it is. But yeah, I mean, it, there is that conversation to be had about, he's a like 72 year old man, mm. like just taking this, this, that kind of headbutt, especially knowing what we know now about concussions mm. and this sort of thing. And it was, it's so reckless. Yeah. Because Vince is always like, when he's in physical angles, he says, "Just hit me." Yeah. He doesn't. He doesn't want to be that to have the properly sell. He wants you to actually go for him. And he's always said, "I'm, you know, I wouldn't ask anyone to do anything yeah. I wasn't willing to do myself." So, you know, fair play to him. He at least, and and actually, credit to to the Mister McMahon character. At least he does get sort of like physical, and he does get hurt, and like mm. the bad guys can get heat on him, and good guys can get heat on him as well. As opposed to the Stephanie McMahon, who just walks down and just goes like, "You're, you're." Sh- Sorry. Yeah, we're going to have to bleep that sorry. one. Just like, well, sorry, you're rubbish. And then the guys just go, yeah, cool, I am. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, they don't get their receipt. Uh, but yeah, Vince went straight down and Owens continued to beat him up. He hit him with a super kick. He then gave him the bullfrog splash and people were running out saying, no, 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 don't do this. I thought Owens' facial expressions in this were amongst the most complex I've seen on a wrestling show in quite some time. It was great. Because he he was obviously filled with rage, like sort of blind with rage, but not the kind of venomous rage. It was kind of confused rage, like psychopathic rage. Uh, Because he he seemed apprehensive at times. You know, he'd do a move and then he'd just sit there almost thinking, what have I done? Yeah. But then he'd go back and do another one. He'd get out the ring and then just get straight back in to... I I, I thought he worked this angle so well. Mm. So brilliantly well. So for the first time in quite a while, I I didn't know who I was going to go for Raw or SmackDown this week. Uh, and, And I thought if we talked about it, it would help me through it. Because I like SmackDown for the Vince and KO angle, but I thought the wrestling side of things was was really really wasteful. But the Raw as well, you know, you had several really good angles, but also you had a few a few duds. I think on the strength of the KO Vince angle, I'm gonna give it to SmackDown. I, unfortunately, it was the only thing I liked on SmackDown, and, yeah. al- and although I did really like it, there was so much more I enjoyed on Raw. Um, yeah. particularly from a wrestling side of things I thought the matches were, were better you had that great opener with Roman Reigns and Jason Jordan, you had the um, Cena Braun Strowman match uh, and and the Sasha and Emma match as well, granted like as a two hour show it would have been much better because mm. you had that kind of duff third hour uh, with a, some really odd segments, then a, a tag match no one cared about, but overall there was just I was, there was so much bad stuff on Smackdown, I thought the gender stuff was awful, the Ziggler stuff was awful, and the wrestling just wasn't given any time you know, Jinder got more promo time than uh, than Natty and Naomi did for a match. And that, to me, is really bad. So, great ending angle aside, I'm going Raw. Yeah. I thought Raw was awesome. Well, it was it was neck and neck, so I'm not going to debate that. No? I, I, I could have gone any other day. I might have tipped over to the Raw side. But what do you think? Vote in the poll above our heads now. Raw versus SmackDown. And I'll announce the results on a WrestleTalk News if I remember. And that's all we've got time for today, so please click the videos that have just appeared over Luke's face to catch up with the latest Wrestle Ramble or Wrestle Talk news. Subscribe to this channel or the podcast. Support Wrestle Talk on Patreon. This has been Luke Owen. I've been Ollie Davis, and that was Ramble.